Good morning, everyone. Today's Wednesday, April 7th. It's 9 a.m. We're ready to start. Uh, our commission secretary is Pam Harlan. Pam, will you please call the roll? Chairman Waters. Present. Commissioner Briscoe. Present. Commissioner Smith. Present. Commissioner Ecker. Present. Commissioner Brinkman. Present. Commissioner Boatwright. Present. We have a quorum. Great. Good to see everybody this morning. Hope you had a good Easter weekend. Uh, we're going to start out this morning with a little safety minute. Uh, on very short notice, I've asked Nicole to join us and talk a little bit about uh, safety. And we've got a lot of agricultural machinery moving on the roads this time of year. So, Nicole, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? I see you now. Yes. Nicole, awesome. Thank you for joining us on such short notice too. Oh, Appreciate definitely. Any Anytime I can raise awareness about safety, that's wonderful. So good morning, Chairman Waters, Commissioners, uh, Director McKenna. It's wonderful to see all of you, even though we're still in this virtual environment. So I hope, I hope you all had the opportunity to enjoy some of the warm weather and the sunshine that we've had over the past several days. And now we're having some of those April showers for those May flowers. So something to look forward to. But speaking of the warmer weather, it also means that our road construction and maintenance operations, they're ramping up across the state. So even more of a reason to remind drivers to slow down in those work zones and be alert for your safety and the safety of the workers. So Work Zone Awareness Week is at the end of the month. It's April 26th through the 30th. And we'll be sharing a presentation with you about some of the work zone awareness activities at the May Commission meeting. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, this is also a very busy time of year for several highway safety campaigns. So we just finished an impaired driving enforcement campaign in March. And then April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month, as well as the campaign that you mentioned, Chairman Waters, a campaign to raise awareness on safely driving around farm equipment as that planning season is getting underway. And then May, it kicks off motorcycle safety awareness. And I don't know about you all, but one thing I've noticed, unfortunately, with the nice weather is I've been seeing quite a few folks riding those motorcycles without helmets. So let's just hope that that doesn't lead to more fatalities and that people can make that safe choice to wear the protective gear when they get on those motorcycles. And then we recently did send out a statewide press release regarding this, um, the state of highway safety, and we're going to do that quarterly throughout the year. So this was for the first quarter of 2021. And unfortunately, a rise in speeding and the other reckless driving behaviors continues to be a disturbing trend. So not, not where we, where we want to be. So I wanted to end my safety minute with just an important message. And this message is very simple. And it's show me zero. So show me zero Missouri. There are four simple actions that we can all take to drive Missouri towards safer roads and make a difference in the number of folks who are being killed on our roadways. And those four simple things are buckle up, phone down, slow down and drive sober. Because we absolutely want everyone to make it home safe. So Chairman Waters, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate you taking time to do that this morning, and and uh, as you know, safety's top priority for for MoDOT, and and we need to continue to uh, try to get to that zero. Try to get yep, to that. Zero. Definitely. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Well, as we continue with our virtual meeting process, we appreciate everyone joining us online. Uh, I'll take just a minute to share a few reminders. Uh, that we use today while we're in the virtual environment. Remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, it's good to use the stage view under the layout layout option. Uh, that'll help you see the pr presentations and presenters a little better. Uh, we ask people to speak slowly and clearly and loud enough to be heard well. There may be some hesitation between people speaking and hearing, so allow time to pass before moving on. Remember, nothing's perfect. If you lose your connection or have trouble, you can try to disconnect and reconnect, or you may just need to change from the video conference to the teleconference. And uh, the secretary should have provided 
information on how to do that. There's uh, you know, several things that we normally do when we meet together in person um, that we just can't do in the remote meeting. And one of these is the, the recognition of special guests. So uh, we, the, we won't be doing that today, but we do allow a public comment period during our meetings. And uh, I'll just remind everybody that we offer that to all Missourians who would like to address the commission. To be able to do that, we ask that uh, those wanting to make comments register be 24 hours before the meeting, and they can do that with our secretary. And uh, those public comments, you'll have five minutes per public comment or 10 minutes per subject. We have a procedural item that we need to continue to follow today regarding abstentions, and I'll quickly review the abstention process. Uh, commissioners, because of land ownership or business interests, or maybe lawyers that represent clients that have some relationship with MoDOT or on a matter that may come before the commission, they may have a potential or actual conflict of interest. So the commissioner will indicate if he or she, he or she chooses to abstain from voting or recuse himself. Um, if the agenda item is divisible by contract, call, project, or something like that, the commissioner can specify the particular matter and still vote on the remainder of the agenda item. All this information is provided to the commission secretary by letter in advance of the meeting, and the secretary will uh, note it, the abstention or recusal in the minutes. Madam Secretary, have all the necessary letters been prepared? They have been prepared. Great. Well, we'll move on to our first item of business, and that's the consideration of minutes for the regular meeting on March 3rd and the special meeting March 2nd. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? I move to be approved. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the minutes. All in favor, say aye. 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 Very good. So, We'll turn now to the consent agenda. Commissioners have all been provided a copy of the consent agenda. Are there, is there any uh, business or item on the consent agenda that should be removed for later discussion or any discussion on the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Great. It's been moved and second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed. Great. Okay. Next order of business is our committee reports. Uh, Commissioner Brinkman serves as the chairman of the audit committee. He serves with Commissioner Briscoe and, and Commissioner Eckert. Commissioner Brinkman, do you have a report today? Mr. Chairman, we wound up not needing a, uh, a meeting this month, but our next meeting is in June of this year, and we'll have a really good report then. All right. Well, I thought that was a good report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Commissioner Briscoe and I serve as the co-chair of the legislative committee. Uh, Mr. Briscoe, I believe you have a report this morning. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you all hear me okay? We can. Okay. The General Assembly is back in full swing after enjoying uh, its annual spring recess. With less than 22 legislative days remaining in this year's session, both the House and Senate are actively pursuing the passage of their respective chamber's legislative priorities, including a fiscal year 2022 budget. While it is much too early to report on those transportation-related measures that may or may not pass this session, I would like to provide the Commission with an update on the funding measure that is currently being considered by the legislature. Senate Bill 262, the fuel tax increase bill passed by the Senate, awaits debate in the House. The Senate proposal would impose an increase of 2.5 cents per gallon each year for five years. These additional revenues, as outlined in our state's constitution, could only be used to build and maintain roads and bridges across the state, with a portion of the revenues going to counties and cities for their transportation needs. The bill also includes language that would allow any taxpayer who does not wish to pay for the new tax an opportunity to request a refund from the state of Missouri 
for the amount of those taxes paid in a given year. This refund is only allowed for passenger vehicles and commercial motor vehicles licensed under 26,000 pounds. The bill also includes an increase in the state's current alternative decal fees and establishes an electric vehicle task force for studying taxation of electric vehicles and a federal mandate provision that disallows a CDL holder to have a commercial motor vehicle license if found guilty of a felony involving human trafficking. As we enter the final lap of this year's legislative session, there will be more to report next month. That concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, Jay and his team, Patrick, have been really busy across the street at the Capitol here recently and appreciate their hard work. Um, Commissioner Smith is the president of the MTFC. I serve on that board with Commissioner Eckert. Greg, do you have a report this morning? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. No, I do not have a report. The next MTFC meeting will be on May 5th. 2021 and I hope to have a lengthy report and hopefully some loans so that that's all I have Thank very you. good we'll, we'll try to make sure that reports extra long for you Greg please <laughs> do about four okay. to five minutes thank let's, you let's, yeah. let's move to Emperor's uh Commissioner Smith Commissioner Brickman and Commissioner Boatwright serve on the Emperor's board I believe Commissioner Brickman has a report for that today, or maybe not. What do you say, Bob? Um, yeah, the board has not met since the last commission meeting, so therefore no report uh, now. Okay. Sure. okay. Well, it's a short month for reports this this time. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're going to catch up here as we move forward through the year, I'm sure. Next item on the agenda is a director's report. Patrick McKenna is the director of MODI. Good morning, Patrick. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, others uh, joining uh, joining us online. Um, great to be here. And uh, um, I, I just want to start by thanking Commissioner Smith for uh, continuing to to um, support our, our effort for recognizing just great work and leadership uh, that that occurs um, throughout the department by um, by presenting uh, last week a, a leadership coin. You see a picture up on the screen to Corey Beasley. Uh, he's a senior maintenance worker from the Southwest District who works out of the Clinton Maintenance Building. He's been with the department Correct. since 20. Yeah. Yes. I, I hate to interrupt you. He's not here yet. He's going to be over here in three or four minutes. So I kind of wanted him to be here if you don't mind. OK, all right. Let me switch so over to uh, schedule a little bit. I told him not to be here till about 925, but they just went to get him. So he'll be here in a few minutes. Sorry okay. about that. OK, I'll no, no problem. I didn't need to interrupt you. No, that's that's fine. Uh, even better to to have him there. I know it's close by. So, uh, you know, uh, every every year also um, coming out of winter, we have uh, particular challenges with the cleanup of roadside trash. Um, this year, it seems to be worse for, you know, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we've reinstituted the no, mo no more trash bash for the month of April to encourage volunteers to help us by cleaning the litter up to help beautify Missouri. This trash bash is an annual part of MoDOT's year round uh, litter control efforts. It's been held every spring since 2004, except for 2020 this past year when COVID-19 forced uh, the cancellation of the event out of safety concerns. Um, additional COVID restrictions limited the use. Uh, we have, uh, many people aren't aware of it, but we have a wonderful partnership with the Department of Corrections. And uh, every year we um, have access to nearly 250 work release uh, prisoners uh, that, that have been able to assist in these efforts uh, along with other maintenance activities. Um, those um, uh, individuals were also not available during the pandemic. Um, so it, it, you know, that and uh, the winter conditions, uh, other, other factors, um, uh, you know, we, we do note that a lot of the trash on the roadways is due to unsecured loads, uh, both commercial and personal. So we certainly ask people to pay attention before they, um, before they go out on the roadways with uh, carrying any materials because that ends up um, really, 
making a, a, a bad impression for visitors to the state. Um, we are strapped with resources ourselves. Last year, we spent over $6 million, almost $6.5 million, to remove litter uh, from more than uh, 385,000 acres uh, of roadsides along the 34,000 miles of state, um, state highway miles. So um, every effort by the public to eliminate or clean up litter helps us. And, and uh, this is one of, the, one of the things that we do deal with in terms of public concern uh, expressed by policymakers and others is that uh, that transition out of winter into the spring maintenance activities. Uh, a lot of times in certain areas of the state, we're still potentially battling uh, winter conditions. We haven't uh, we haven't changed over the equipment uh, to remove the remove the plows. Uh, it's the same equipment that we're using in many cases, uh, and 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 also the criticality coming out of winter for our maintenance crews is really roadside maintenance. It's getting to those potholes. It's the, it's the damage that winter and the freeze thaw cycle has created that is the pressing primary um, priority for our, for our maintenance uh, workers. So uh, the public sometimes does get frustrated that it takes us a little while uh, to really ramp up the efforts on the litter pickup. But I, I, hope, um, I hope the commission and, and the public does understand uh, we we do everything almost on a on a triage basis, highest priority first, and uh, those roadsides are where um, where where safety incidents can occur, uh, and then we move on the on the uh, lower uh, priority items like the trash pickup um, to do that. We're we're encouraging our adopt a highway volunteers to do their section pickups in April, but we also invite anybody uh, who wants to help join. Uh, for a one-time pickup. We're actually encouraging that um, throughout the department. We, we have had uh, many people telecommuting in the department, and during the month of April, uh, we're actually asking volunteers from within the department to get out there and help our maintenance crews so that we're all doing this as, uh, as uh, you know, one team. Um, it's, it's a great effort. It's something in good weather where, uh, you know, a lot of us uh, that uh, would like to help out, um, you know, frankly, our maintenance crews are professionals. Uh, it requires a, a high degree of training, um, it, particularly on the safety side of things to do much of the work that our safety, that our maintenance professionals do. And um, so a lot of the people that work in other aspects of the organization really don't have the training to get out and, and safely do the maintenance activities. But picking up trash is certainly one where all of us can, can lend a hand and that's something that we're trying to do, uh, certainly in the month of April, and, and uh, we're picking that up. So I think uh, the public will see progress uh, over the course of the next month. We appreciate their patience, and, uh, and we really do um, appreciate the public's support when they go out and adopt a highway. Uh, it's a great opportunity for, for students, civic groups, uh, civic groups and, and those looking to receive community service credits while they beautify their community. Um, over the years, our volunteers have made this program a great success. So, uh, you, you know, I, I happen to have witnessed uh, this this past weekend um, uh, in the Columbia area. There was a there was an older gentleman. Um, I won't say older, but you know, you could tell he was retired, um, probably well into his seventies, and uh, he was on uh, Route sixty three uh, between Jefferson City and Columbia. And uh, over the few hours that I I was traveling and coming back, uh, I'll bet he um, put five, uh, five miles of cleanup um, just himself uh, doing that night. I counted at least 20 full trash bags full of trash. Uh, just an extraordinary effort by an individual out there lending a hand. You know, it, it made me think I wouldn't be surprised if that was a retired MoDOT uh, employee out there. So um, it's just great. It's great to see people doing that, doing it safely and and uh, and lending a hand, but uh, again, it, it it I think it gives everybody a sense of pride to help uh, beautify the state and make sure it looks nice um, for for everybody. Uh, it's, so it's a it's a great activity. You know, um, recently, and uh, Greg, do I see that Corey's uh, with you there? Okay. Yes, um, I do have Corey with me this morning, Director. Great. Hey, welcome, welcome, Corey. Glad you're able to join us. Um, you know, as, as I started to say, um, we, we have a leadership um, recognition program and we have a, a coin that gets passed, uh, many times passed by employee to employee, uh, team member to team member. But um, we're really uh, pleased that uh, that Commissioner Smith 
uh, recognized uh, our Corey Beasley, a senior maintenance worker from the district um, for some, some really good work. Corey's been with us since 2016, um, well liked by his coworkers and really conscientious um, uh, member of the team. Uh, on, on the evening of, uh, of, of March 11th, Corey was off duty and driving when he noticed a car was parked uh, close to one of what he, he looked at it and thought this has got to be a, a MoDOT uh, tractor. And he really suspected that the driver was attempting to break in and steal the tractor. Uh, you know, he pulled over, called 911, described the scene, the vehicle, the suspect, um, turned his vehicle around, and he continued to monitor the driver from a safe distance. Uh, then he contacted his supervisor, uh, and uh, once law enforcement arrived and had the suspect in custody, Corey stayed on the scene to provide details uh, to the responding officers. He also stayed to assist his supervisor with inspecting the tractor for any damage. Uh, you, you know, I tell you, this is, it's one of those uh, things, uh, Steve Campbell, um, the Southwest District Engineer, brought this to our attention, and, you know, it's, it's, it may seem like a small thing, but this is a this is an employee that that takes their public service seriously. Um, you know, on your own time, driving busy to get somewhere, a lot of people might just look the other way, uh, but Corey didn't, uh, and he saved the state money. Uh, he made sure that somebody that was uh, misbehaving and trying to steal um, the public's assets was apprehended and dealt with uh, accordingly. And uh, for the entire department, we just want to say thank you to to Corey. Um, Commissioner Smith uh, has has always uh, taken an active, uh, you know, active uh, relationship with the with the local um, uh, employees in Clinton, and uh, I, I really do appreciate your your willingness to to um, uh, to recognize Corey for his for his good work. Uh, that's above and beyond, and and uh, it's just the type of thing that is worthy of recognition. So I just want to say thank you to Corey and and uh, Corey, if you if you want to say anything you can if you don't that's fine uh commissioner smith i don't know if you'd like to add anything there uh happy to hear from you well i'll let corey go here in just a second but you know his quick response and i will tell you he had his three kids with him uh when he rolled up there and it's probably a good thing for that guy that was uh, trying to steal that tractor that he had his kids <laughs> and he couldn't get out of the car but uh, yeah it's 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 employees like that that really care about about MoDOT and saving the taxpayers money and, and don't like a thief, just like I do. So with that, I'll, I'll let Corey say something if he'd like to, but I appreciate uh, you letting me uh, give him the leadership coin and it's well-deserved for him, so. Yeah, I just thought it was cool to be a part of that. I'm sick of thieves just like everyone else. They've hit my dad's business and just thought it was cool to be able to catch one of them. Yeah, he actually got in the tractor and fired it up and was hidden, had moved it. So it was pretty cool to be able to catch you. That's this just is great. a real remote area where this happened too. So he he knocked the ignition out, I guess, with some tools and had it fired up and everything. So wow, wow, but that's anyway, you know I, you. I tell you, thanks Corey, really really appreciate it, and uh, Commissioner Smith, thanks for thanks for taking some time out to uh, to uh, go to the go to the shed last week and to recognize Corey and to to pass that coin along. Um, it's, it's been a, it's been a good program. Uh, and, and I tell you, we, we just, it's amazing to me. Um, every time we hear of, uh, an employee, uh, doing something like what Corey did. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not unusual. This is the type of employee we have at MoDOT. It's, uh, um, I, I think the public really needs to understand just the, the high caliber public servants who, who take, who take ownership of of our responsibilities, the assets that we're entrusted with, of the uh, that the public pays for, and and uh, that quick action saved us a bunch of money. So thank you again, Corey. Great job. You know, thank um, you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Job, Corey. <laughs> it looks like the chairman's trying to say something there. Are you trying to say something, Tom? So I think that's just great. What a, what a great story, and Greg. Thanks to you for highlighting it, and uh, Corey, great work. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Great, thanks. Thought I'd give you a really quick update on um, kind of where we are. There's obviously a lot of talk going around uh, the the state and the country about uh, transportation investment right now. 
Uh, and I, I think the way we've been approaching this as a department is uh, what I what I think we ought to be doing, which is uh, which is planning for um, possibilities. Uh, not not um, we don't want to be caught flat-footed as a state if there are investment dollars to be deployed um, for the benefit of Missouri, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. But the way we're trying to look at this, um, I, I really look at what's going on right now. There's a lot of discussion. There are a lot of proposals. There are a lot of, the, and there's um, a lot of confusion. You know, what what does it all mean? Uh, when will it benefit the state? And and so the way I look at it is, you know, we're we're kind of putting things in categories: bird in the hand and and birds in the bush. And there's a lot more in the bush right now than in hand. Uh, so we are, as a department, really uh, monitoring and and staying in tune with that. But I think it's it's um it's a good idea to kind of go through just in general terms where we are in hand what we have right now is uh the first thing we have in hand is just our normal process the the normal process for developing statewide transportation improvement program uh and going through the state budget process this is normal order uh business and we're on track uh with with all of those matters we really appreciate what's going on in the general assembly as they as they discuss and debate um resource availability for the for the department and for the commission. Um, and uh, we also have in hand, which is already passed at the federal level, um, uh, CARES Act funding. We did, uh, and thanks to uh, Governor Parson and the administration, they were uh, creative and, and uh, innovative and seized on some opportunities to seek reimbursement for some of the um, costs uh, during the pandemic and, were, and allocated some of those uh, savings and reimbursements back to uh, the state road fund to MoDOT uh, and to the commission for allocation. So um, we had about $73 million allocated by the governor for that purpose. Um, the commission's uh, seized on that with um, uh, the creation of a asset management deficit uh, program for our maintenance operations where um, we're hopeful with additional approval in the Senate uh, that we'll have a program that will kick off uh, to help us with disparities around the state uh, with condition of low volume roads and other assets that our maintenance crews take care of um, to the tune of about $15 million a year. That's something we've talked about for, for many years. Uh, I know it's a frustration that we haven't had the resources to get to all of the, the issues that, that our citizens would like us to, um, but this is, a, this is a big shot in the arm and it's, uh, it also enabled uh, the governor uh, to reinstate funding for uh, the cost share program that he put in place uh, a year ago uh, that was uh, suspended uh, briefly, about 25 million was suspended um, during the pandemic when we were still looking at where the revenue was. Um, and then uh, that that's helped us with our own cost share. It's helped us with important projects like East Locust Creek. It's helping us with a, a project um, in Lee's Summit and in other areas of the state. So uh, tremendous support from the administration. We really appreciate it. Uh, and we're making sure that we're we're getting those dollars uh, deployed and, and utilized and, and out on the on the streets. Um, we also had a COVID relief bill. Uh, that included $10 billion for transportation for DOT kind of backstop to support um, the pandemic decline in revenues and, and kind of with a, with a view of a tail to that revenue decline. As it stands right now, we're still off uh, just about 5% uh, this year in total motor fuel tax uh, receipts. Uh, we, we have had a rebounding of um, motor, uh, motor vehicle sales tax and license and registration fees. So um, we're, we're in good shape uh, thus far uh, in, in a revenue situation. The, the COVID Relief Act actually helped us um, backstop some of those funds and, and help us plan for our current uh, statewide transportation improvement program. That provided about $234 million for the state of Missouri. About 34 million of that is sub allocated to our metropolitan planning organizations and uh, at the department level uh, that left about 200 million dollars. I'm really uh, pleased that the Commission was able to uh, accept that with an updated financial plan that we presented in February and uh, we've been working with our federal partners to draw down those resources fully obligate them and we have that money designated in the coming uh, draft uh, stip that will be presented to the commission in, in May. So um, we're deploying all those uh, dollars quickly 
uh, as I think everyone would expect. Uh, the items that are the ones that we would consider kind of in the bush um, are, are at present on the statewide side. Um, uh, the, as as um, as you just heard, the the gas tax bill, um, two of which are moving through uh, the legislative process, one from Senator Schatz, one from um, uh, Transportation Committee Chair in the House, uh, Becky Ruth. Uh, we really do appreciate their leadership in this area. Um, we've participated in the discussions. I know the commission has been very supportive of this. We'd like to get this over the finish, finish line. You know, keep in mind, we're still deficit spending in the state road fund to be able to draw the current federal funds into the state. So an increase in this gas tax actually will help us repair the state road fund and enable us to match federal dollars uh, going forward for years to come, including some of these uh, proposals that are floating around at the at the federal level. It's It's a vitally important move for us. We haven't seen that movement in, in, a, in a change to the gas tax since 1996, and we've lost a lot of purchasing power due to inflation over that period of time. Um, that's, that's one that's uh, moving forward, um, and, and uh, we're hopeful, uh, of course, and very supportive of the legislative efforts to do so. Uh, in, it also kind of in the bush, uh, things that are being discussed, um, uh, and one that's kind of in both categories is the um, American Recovery Act, which was passed, that's the $1.9 trillion bill that was passed several weeks ago at the national level. Uh, there, there are some, um, some folks, and at the national level with, with AASHTO, we do believe that there is, um, there is justification uh, provided in the bill on the economic development and reco recovery side of that bill, where some of those funds may be utilized for uh, investment in infrastructure. Uh, and that's not going to be a decision that'll be up to um, really either the commission or the department. Uh, that really comes down to uh, the, the governor, the general assembly, and municipalities who are directly allocated those funds. A lot of work has to be done to sort through um, the use of those funds and whether any becomes available for, for this. We're monitoring that. And we're, we're certainly looking to work with anybody um, at the at the state or municipal level, uh, should they want to have us work together on a plan, um, the the Jobs Act, which is um, being discussed now, uh, that was announced by um, President Biden uh, a couple weeks ago, and and he'll be speaking, uh, I believe, on a on a national press event today uh, on this. That outlines about two point three trillion dollars, uh, as we see it. Uh, about one hundred and fifteen billion is available for road and bridge. Um, improvements, uh, kind of the core work that MoDOT does, uh, and, and certainly uh, over $400 billion more for other modes of transportation. So pretty significant investment. Um, that's that's um, going to go through a national legislative debate and, uh, um, and requires legislative action. So we're, we're monitoring that. We're working with the association with AASHTO and with our regional association at MASTO to make sure that we're prepared uh, should any availability of resources come forward. So we'll keep you posted on that. And then um, uh, kind of normal order is reauthorization of surface transportation. Uh, that was extended, as we talked about, that was uh, continued uh, for one year. It expired last September. Uh, we have a continuation and an extension through this September. So that's work that Congress has to, has to get through. We're very fortunate that uh, Congressman Graves sits on uh, as ranking member of the House T&I Committee, uh, and uh, he's having a big hand in how that gets shaped. So again, all of those are kind of in the bush, but we're, we're um, looking at those. Uh, so the response, in as these have developed over the uh, last several months, we, we felt that it was important for, um, for our enterprise uh, to go out to our planning partners and to say, uh, and to update, you know, on a project by project on a regional basis, uh, to identify uh, unfunded priorities for um, transportation improvements, for road and bridge improvements around the state. I'm pleased to report, and you'll hear from Eric Schrader uh, and Frank Miller later uh, in this in this meeting that our that our team has completed that effort, and we have before you, and hopefully with your consent and approval, uh, kind of a sanctioning of that process. We think that this is an important addition to our annual process for. Um, for the work that we do and to have an orderly um, uh, way to uh, identify those those uh, needs that we're not getting to based on the funding we have. 
Uh, but the the response to all of the variability with the potential for federal funds, um, I think, is this. We have planned for, we've gone to our, our local planning partners, um, and we've been all over the state to, um, to accumulate this uh, report of unfunded needs. It gives great definition to about $3 billion out of the you know, what we understand to be eight to $10 billion of unfunded needs in the state. And we're gonna continue that forward after we update the STIP. So we're very excited about that. And I think that this is really the answer um, to how we prepare for the possibility of additional resources. You do it by defining what the needs are, uh, working with your local partners and uh, putting them down on paper so that uh, we can go through a public process should there be more resources available. So. I want to thank our team and our planning partners for really serious uh, consideration. And we did this in short order during our normal work for the uh, STIP. So they doubled down on the work that they were doing. I also just wanted to, uh, to mention, I'm, I'm uh, pleased to report that, uh, that uh, continuing efforts with AASHTO um, uh, I have recently been asked, and, and I appreciate the, the Commission's uh, support in this, um, to, to continue to be engaged at the national level. Um, they've, uh, President uh, Victoria Sheehan and, and Executive Director Jim Timon uh, asked me last week uh, to uh, participate as Chairman of the National Safety Committee. Uh, I think that fits very well with our with our mission here at MoDOT. You can see our team, you know, led by Becky Almaroth and and uh, Nicole Hood, John Nelson. Uh, we've just got a great team here that that uh, uh, focus on safety. And, uh, you know, it's partially because of the recognition of the work that we've done. And recently, um, AASHTO Executive Director Jim Timon uh, gave our buckle up phone down effort some national attention uh, in this video that I'd like to share with you. So if we could roll that, please. Well, at the height of the stay at home orders during the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a decrease in driving. And logically, we thought we would see a decrease in the number of highway fatalities as well. But unfortunately, we saw uh, an increase in the amount of speeding. We continued to see a lack of usage of seatbelts, and that resulted in an increase in, in roadway fatalities and an increase in, in serious crashes. Well, safety is AASHTO's number one priority, and I think if you asked each of our state DOT members, they would say the same thing. Our ultimate goal is to get to zero highway fatalities and to do that as soon as possible. So we were really excited to partner with the Road to Zero Coalition, the Vision Zero Network, and other organizations that have adopted the Towards Zero Deaths national strategy for improving highway safety on this letter urging President Biden to push for zero highway related fatalities by 2050. Well, I think with an issue as important as this, you have to start at the top. So the letter was addressed to President Biden, but absolutely we are looking forward to working with the senior leadership at USDOT and Secretary Buttigieg and his team to make this vision and this goal of getting to zero highway fatalities by 2050 a reality. We've seen some really innovative and successful initiatives at the state level to drive down the number of highway fatalities and to increase highway safety. One great example of that is the Buckle Up Phone Down initiative in Missouri. Uh, they've had tremendous success using that initiative and a lot of other states have adopted that principle and that campaign in order to help bring down fatalities and improve highway safety in their states. So we'd love for USDOT to take a look at some of the successful initiatives that have happened at the state level and to really support those and find ways to promote those so that uh, they can have more of an impact nationwide. So just uh, great, great recognition there at the national level for the for the creativity and innovation and work that we're doing. You know, we're we're um, as a state, it's it's an interesting thing. This is uh, buckle up, phone down was created out of necessity uh, because we we have literally one of the worst um, policy um, uh, 
uh, records on safety, on highway safety in the nation. Uh, it's, it's really troubling, and we've gone backwards in that in the, in the last couple of years with the repeal of the motorcycle um, helmet law that was in place. Uh, I know a lot of people lay this out as a personal freedom issue, but uh, honestly, operating safely on our nation's highways, on our state highways, is, is, um, is a responsibility, uh, and operating unsafely is not a right. Uh, and that's that's an issue that we continue to try to make um, the commission's support. Um, every year we bring legislative proposals to increase our safety policy measures, but uh, we have much work to do. And I, I do believe it's uh, just a vital effort. You know, despite the the pandemic and the and the the fatalities in the pandemic this year, um, that somewhat over over emphasizes or outweighs other issues you know we're still losing uh over 38,000 uh, Americans on the roadways per year and that's unacceptable and we have to continue to work to um to solve that problem i think working at the national level bringing ideas like um buckle up phone down to the national level is is vitally important and and it's just an honor to be a part of that so um our team's done a great job and we we will continue to work hard on this uh, it's vitally important for uh, the safety of every uh, Missourian that travels on our roadways. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my report. Great, thank Mr. you, Chairman. Patrick. There, yeah, great. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd like to make a comment. I think uh, I think it's an honor uh, that uh, that Patrick was asked to be chairman of the National Safety Committee, and that's that's a real honor. And I think it's a great state. Uh, statement for the state. So I appreciate it, Patrick. As I said before, you know, I know it takes extra time for you, but I appreciate what you do. And I just, I just want you to know that I really, really am uh, proud of you and, and the job you've done as ASTO president and the job I know you're going to do as chairman of the National Safety Committee. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Great. Any other discussion or comments? On yeah, that's great. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, you know, Patrick, your report on the the uh, picking up the trash. I mean, that that's to me is just depressing. And to think of all the money we spend there that could be going to uh, other projects, um, it's just a disgrace. But once again, you know, we step up and do what we need to do. But um, it, it sure would be nice if we could uh, curb that problem. Yeah, I, I completely agree. That does seem like money that's wasted, doesn't it? You know, I know everybody wants it done, but um, that's just throwing money in the trash. Uh, that's really what it what it is. And, uh, you know, our team takes a lot of um, we get a lot of uh, uh, consternation and expressed uh, in public comments and, and everything. Uh, and, you know, our our team is really not rigged or 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 staffed enough to to meet all of our challenges. And this is a real distraction to us. We know it needs to be done uh, and we we are really going at it, but you know, we're we're asking a lot of people to to help out here. And the biggest help we could have is if people secured their loads and commercial uh, trash haulers and others uh, secured those loads so that we didn't have this trash problem in the first place. Uh, that's where it starts is someone throwing something out of the window or or not securing their load. And that's that's really where we have to curb this. And it's a public, again, it's public behavior and public awareness. We just need that partnership with the traveling public. Um, and uh, it, certainly we appreciate those that volunteer to help us deal with the problem because that saves us a lot of money. And the partnership with the Department of Corrections has saved us tens of millions of dollars um, over the past several decades that we've we've done this. And uh, we, we we really do appreciate that partnership because that does save us a lot of money. There's a kind of a, a bright light in that in that story that um, state uh, agencies working together do uh, save uh, the taxpayers money. Thanks. Very good. Any other comments or questions for Patrick? Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate the report. We're going to move now to the consideration of bids on transportation improvements. Travis Kessner is our state design engineer. Travis, the floor is yours. Good morning, Chairman Waters, Commissioners, Director McKenna. I'm here today to talk about the March 19th, 2021 bid opening, where MoDOT received 87 bids on 27 calls. We recommend the following to you today. 
and that's to award all calls to the lowest responsive bidder except for call H02 located in the Southeast District. We recommend rejection of call H02 due to excessive bids for section 102.15 of the Missouri standard specifications for highway construction. So pretty short, but that's the report today. That's what we recommend. Any questions or comments for Travis? Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion that we approve the uh, bids that uh, Travis Second. presented. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. We approve the bids and uh, reject, uh, I believe it was H02. Yep. All in favor of the recommendation, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed the same sign? The motion carries. Thank you, Travis. Do you have a budget report this morning for us? Uh, yeah, here real quick for the uh, focus on bridges. To, uh, as of today, with the awards that you just did, that would be 163 bridges awarded for 182.3 million, which is uh, just right at $200,000 over budget. So running pretty close on that program, looking good. For the year, we have awards of 710 million, which are uh, $61 million under budget for the state fiscal year. So uh, next month, April 16th, we have a $36 million bid opening. And then in May, bid opening is going to be over $100 million. There's quite a bit of work coming up in May. So, Great. Thank you, Travis. You know, when my kids were small, they used to hold their breath every time we crossed the bridge. So we got a, a lot of bridges now that they don't have to hold their breath in, right? <laughs> boy, boy, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for that report, Travis. All right. Thank you. So we're going to move now into our uh, dive a little deeper into MoDOT as we, we look at the different divisions and, and departments of the of the MoDOT. And we're going to start today with the communications division update. And uh, Linda Wilson-Horn is our director of communications. Welcome, Linda. Thanks for Good being morning. here. Good morning. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. All right. Well, Chairman Waters, Commissioners, and Director McKenna, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, give you an update about the Communications Division. I know you're very familiar with our video and, and photography team, but uh, today I'm going to give you some insight on more about what we do. Um, the Communications Division consists of content creation, production, special projects, and customer service. We work in coordination with communications staff in each district office. And we take communications products from creative ideas to fully executed plans for both our internal and external customers. Uh, we truly serve as an in-house advertising and public relations agency for MoDOT. I'm going to start with a video that gives a brief look at the services we provide, and then I'll expand on that video afterwards. So next slide, please. Thank you. You guys can move on to the next slide. Now I'm going to go into a little more detail on, on some of the services that were highlighted. So first I'm going to start with media relations and outreach. Our team works hard to foster positive relationships with our media outlets across the state. 
who are a vital part of helping us tell the MoDOT story. Our team of communications professionals work with staff to help them refine their talking points and prepare for media interviews. We organize news conferences throughout the year to bring attention to things like buckle up phone down, new construction with major traffic impacts or winter operations. During the pandemic, we've had to prepare staff with backdrops and lighting to do Zoom media interviews, speeches, and even for the director to run the AASHTO annual meeting virtually. More than 40,000 people across Missouri receive our news releases and information through our e-update system. We offer um, our external um, express lane, which is delivered every other week to 21,000 subscribers statewide. Next slide, please. The communications team supports the department's billion dollar a year program delivery efforts. We help our engineers develop public involvement plans for planning studies, environmental studies, and overall project development. We keep the public informed through detailed project websites, public meetings, and construction update emails. We mark progress with groundbreaking and ribbon cutting ceremonies. Next slide, please. Social media, such as Facebook and Twitter, is a standard communications tool for providing safety messages, construction updates, or awareness of weather warnings or highway closures. Social media allows us to interact directly with our customers. We have nearly 195,000 followers on MoDOT's Twitter accounts across the state, and our MoDOT Facebook accounts have more than 400,000 followers. Last year, our Twitter impressions were more than 83 million, and our Facebook reach was another uh, nearly 17 million. Next slide, please. Our website is another vital tool to provide information to the public. Over the past couple of years, we've transitioned our website to a new content management tool, which allows our website to work well on mobile devices. Um, mobile users actually make up more than half of our website visitors, so that was an important upgrade to our system. In 2020, our website had nearly 5 million sessions with page views reaching nearly 10 million. Next slide, please. Photography is an important part of storytelling. Uh, images are used in all of our communication platforms and we are blessed with some great photographers as you all well know. We're capable of shooting aerials for projects, work zone photos for internal and external use, um, event photography, and we even do photos for legal documentation and much more. On our MoDOT Flickr library, we currently house nearly 65,000 photos that have had more than 13 million views. Next slide, please. Graphic design helps us brand our information and make it visually appealing, whether that's creating a logo, uh, new advertising campaigns, PSAs, um, or materials to help educate um, our citizens, such as the Citizen's Guide to Transportation Funding. Next slide, please. We also have our own in-house print shop that is able to print in both color and black and white. Uh, having those services internally uh, saves us a lot of money. Uh, we print items for the department, including training materials, safety posters, external publications, project plans, reports, business cards, and event materials. Uh, last year, we had about 1,000 printing projects. Um, typically, we handle about 3,000 a year, so uh, with a lot less interaction going on, we, we printed a lot less in, uh, in 2020. But having those in-house capabilities gives us uh, timely and inexpensive printed materials. Next slide, please. So all of these various components come together into the initiatives that you see. Um, things like our Buckle Up Phone Down campaign, Don't Drive Impaired, uh, and the upcoming Work Zone Awareness Week. Um, the image you see there on the screen is from our new campaign, which is work with us. Next slide, please. Employees are a key audience for us as well. Our internal newsletter connections is sent via email to every MoDOT employee every other week. Articles are submitted from the communications staff across the state, highlighting major projects and individual accomplishments as well as sharing the latest news about internal policies or other changes. 
We also publish a weekly newsletter that is delivered electronically to all employees via monitors in our every MoDOT facility. The weekly news was designed to highlight some of the top news and provide a concise way to share that with our frontline staff in buildings across the state. We use these two publications along with emails, videos, and virtual meetings to keep our employees informed about up up MoDOT issues and changing policies. Next slide, please. We could not do all of our storytelling without the incredible team of communication staff we have located in every district. Seven district communication managers that you see on the screen oversee the regional production and content creation, project delivery support, and customer service. They handle the local media requests and all the work associated with supporting project delivery and public involvement and the day-to-day -day communication on construction and maintenance impacts to the traveling public. In total, we have approximately 30 professional communication staff spread out across the seven district offices and the central office. Next slide, please. Lastly, I wanna talk about our customer service centers. MoDOT created its customer service center and toll-free number in 1996, that's 25 years ago. Uh, we continue to provide outstanding customer service and a live person answering the phone 24 seven. Our customer service centers are housed in each district with at least two reps and in the larger urban areas, they have additional staff. In addition, the St. Louis Center answers calls 24 seven with a combination of MoDOT personnel and contracted staff that maintain our operations 365 days a year. In 2020, our customer service reps handled more than 125,000 customer calls and generated nearly 35,000 call reports for MoDOT staff to respond to those customer concerns. So how are, how are we doing? Well, our February 2020 report, 94% of our survey respondents said MoDOT staff were polite, 88% said we were responsive, and 87% they were satisfied with the clarity and the response they received. Um, we continue to work on customer service because it's certainly not just the role of, of these customer service reps, but every employee within MoDOT plays a role in providing that customer service to the public. Next slide, please. So we're, we're really proud um, of what we do. We're proud to serve the citizens of Missouri with critical information that they need to safely use our transportation system and most importantly, our team um, loves to tell the great story of MoDOT and its staff. So thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, great report, Linda. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions for Linda? Yeah, Linda, Linda, I want to thank you for your presentation uh, and for your leadership in the communications division. You have a team of very uh, creative folks who do great quality work and support they provide for us for these meetings is, is truly appreciated. And, and we really, I'm sincere in saying that. Thank you. Thanks very much. The comments, questions? Wow. Well, important work, Lynn, and you have a, a great team behind you and you cover a lot of ground. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to put your uh, message together today and and uh, it's good to see you again. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We're going to turn now to our information systems update. And uh, Beth Ring is the information systems director. I heard Beth. There you are. Beth, good morning. Good to good see morning. you again. It's been a while since we've seen you. It has been. It has been. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Director McKenna, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity this morning. There's a lot of really exciting things that are happening within the information systems division, and I'm glad to, to have the opportunity to share those with you. Uh, Jennifer, if you could tee up my PowerPoint presentation for me. It really is um, very difficult to think about any part of our personal or professional lives that have not been touched by or impacted by technology. And I think that that's been particularly true during the last year when we've been so desperately trying to remain socially distant from one another while remaining connected. Um, next slide, please. 
Our role within information systems is to build and maintain a critical IT infrastructure to support team MoDOT and provide information to the traveling public. We do that through the 90 very talented employees that we have statewide, about a third of which are located in the district offices. And we supplement that staff with external contractors. I'd like to point out that most of the photographs contained within my PowerPoint presentation are actual employees of information systems. And I intentionally did that because I truly believe that they are the stars of the show. Uh, you'll want to note that the pictures were taken pre pandemic. So don't be concerned if you don't see any face masks or see socially distanced. Um, it's easy to think about technology at, you know, from the. Through the lens of what we use every day, the applications that we use, the laptops and the iPhones, but the work that we do is so much more complex than that. Uh, we manage a statewide fiber optic network. We have disaster recovery plans and exercises. We have developers that write applications uh, for internal software for use uh, by MoDOT or the public. Uh, we handle cybersecurity, we take care of phones, and we do our own procurement uh, through state statute. Uh, next slide, please. We handle those responsibilities by using the $20 million that you have allocated to our division. And, and like roadway uh, uh, maintenance, we are not only responsible for providing the resources for new technology solutions, but we're also responsible for maintaining our existing system. And like managing roads and bridges, we try to um, hold down the cost of taking care of the system so that we can provide as many resources towards new solutions as possible. Historically, we've been able to carve out about 20% of that budget or $4 million uh, to invest in new, new solutions because of the fact that it costs about $16 million a year to maintain the system. And you'll note on my slide, we spend about $10 million a year on uh, software licensing and maintenance. It's very expensive. With the remaining expenses going towards hardware maintenance, replacements, networking, and communication. Next slide, please. You may recognize this gentleman. I think Scott has uh, helped you with commission meetings over the years. Uh, so you've uh, you've experienced firsthand the great customer service that our division staff give to our partners. But in addition to what Scott does, we have uh, about 9,800 pieces of equipment, uh, laptops, desktops, iPhones, and printers that we maintain. Our help desk on average receives about 35,000 calls a year. Uh, we input tickets. Typically, these are technology problems that we have to put in a ticket and resolve those problems for people. Um, I mentioned the fiber optic network in the previous slide, and I wanna make sure that you understand the magnitude of this. Uh, this is not like calling um, Mediacom and connecting to your home. We have hundreds of miles of fiber that we either own or we own the right to use. And we purchase and manage the equipment that, that manages the traffic on this network that connects not only hundreds of our facilities, but also many of our uh, traffic devices around the state. It's a huge asset. We have around 550 servers on which our applications reside. Next slide, please. We literally maintain uh, and manage hundreds of applications, but I wanna point out some of the higher impact uh, applications for you. Um, I think all of you are familiar with the traveler information map. This is an application that we've used for years internally to um, manage roadway conditions and the traveling public relies on this significantly so that they can get safely to their destination. We are what uh, people refer to as a Microsoft shop, which means that a lot of our collaboration tools are purchased through Microsoft, your email, SharePoint, Teams, uh, so we, we rely a lot on Microsoft for those products. The transportation management system is a suite of applications that we built many years ago uh, to uh, house um, all, all things roadway and roadway bridge and roadway features. Uh, there's mapping capabilities, it's location based, 
and many of our critical transportation decisions are um, based off of information contained within TMS. Uh, what springs to mind is the creation of the step. The maintenance management system is a relatively new concept. Uh, Becky Almaroff uh, formed a team years ago, a dedicated team that was uh, uh, designed to provide automation to that section of our organization that was um, really uh, the least served by technology. And the maintenance management system is designed to help our maintenance crews do their work easier and help our leadership make decisions that are fact-based. The dedicated team takes the lead on maintenance management system and information systems provides the resources and the technology support for that. And then MoDOT Carrier Express is the suite of applications that manages all things motor carrier. Next slide, please. We have a number of goals within our division, uh, but first and foremost, uh, we try very hard to prioritize and align all of our work with the MoDOT strategy. As you can imagine, we get a lot of requests in for technology, and we always try to hold them up to the light to make sure that there's a direct connection between what we're trying to achieve from the technology perspective. Does it help us achieve our goals as an organization? We aim to build and maintain a sustainable and secure IT environment. Uh, to the extent possible, we utilize external resources so that we can take the 90 people that we're um, blessed to have on board and have them focus on things that are unique to MoDOT and unique to transportation. Uh, we uh, aim to preserve, protect, and fully utilize our data and always uh, work towards building and maintaining an engaged workforce. Next slide, please. There are many challenges that go along with working in technology. The one that really springs to mind is the pandemic response. And I think back to just a little over a year ago uh, when we were told that with very little notice that most of our organization was going to have to begin to work remotely. And you would have been amazed if you would have seen how quickly this staff provided thousands of people with the tools and the technology so that they could continue to work from home. It was it was really amazing. But uh, that really wasn't the extent of it. During the course of the year, we've, we've uh, analyzed and provided collaboration tools. Uh, WebEx is a perfect example. That's the tool that's used to conduct meetings, including the commission meeting. Uh, we've had application developers that developed uh, an application to track positive COVID cases with heat maps. We uh, wrote uh, an application to manage all of the COVID testing that took place during the during the co course of the pandemic. We provided a mechanism for all state employees to sign up for vaccination clinics. So as you can see, we've been very engaged in working through the pandemic. And now we are turning our attention to what is this organization going to look like post pandemic? Where are people going to work? What are they going to be doing and what tools do they need to get that work done? Cybersecurity is always a huge issue uh, when you speak about anything technology. And you might think, what interest would the bad actors have in a Department of Transportation? But I can tell you that over the last year, there have been over 15,000 um, email campaigns where a bad actors attempt, uh, attempted to breach our environment through um, bad code contained in uh, email links or email attachments. So, so the problem is real. We are really fortunate in that the, the statewide office of cybersecurity uh, works very closely with us. They have a lot of really talented people. We have recently created and filled a security officer position. We have a lot of tools, but unfortunately, 95% of successful breaches are a result of human error. So it is a constant battle to stay in front of. The next challenge I've noted is, interestingly enough, the thing that I believe attracts most people to this line of work, which is the excitement of uh, technology constantly evolving. But from a leadership perspective, uh, it really it really requires a lot of discipline because what often happens is, by the time you get your business problem defined, identify a, a solution and begin implementation, something bigger and better comes along. 
And if you're not really disciplined, if you don't make sure that you select the right projects, uh, you can be very, very distracted by that. So we make sure that everyone who wants to do anything technology related puts a cost benefit analysis together and commits to that long term vision. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is something that I know that you've heard from a lot of MoDOT um, areas, which is it's it's a it's a huge challenge to recruit and retain quality staff. Uh, technology um, skill sets have been in, in high demand for a very long time, and although MoDOT has a lot to offer, we we have very exciting work. We offer a lot of flexibility. People have been very impressed with the way that we managed our way through the pandemic. At the end of the day, people have families to feed and so money matters. Uh, so I am very, very appreciative and on behalf of the division, we appreciate the support that you've given us uh, for, the, for the MoDOT pay plan. Next slide, please. I hope that in this very short period of time, I've given you a flavor for all of the really uh, important and exciting things that we do within the information systems division. And I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you, Beth. Any questions or discussion? Beth, this is Bob Brinkman. Uh, what a great uh, presentation on information systems. But uh, by definition, that's what you do. Um, so <laughs> good work there. Um, I, I'm reminded I graduated 50 years ago this May, and it was the first computer science major out of Rolla. And we had those Fortran cards, and I was thinking, what the heck are these guys going to do for a living? Mm -hmm. and look where we are. So it brings to mind a question. How long has it been since you did this by hand at, at MoDOT uh, before we had computers? Or um, You probably had computers before you had PCs, but how, how long has it been since you got those computers? It is a great question. It is my understanding that it wasn't until the early 90s uh, when the organization began to automate some of the things that were done manually. So it's been uh, 30 years uh, in the making. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we can provide so much uh, more in services with the message boards and all the stuff that you're doing there. Really cool stuff. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Very good. Thank you. Mr. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Commissioner Boat, right? So, uh, cloud based data, how, um, how, how's that transition over to backups, that type of thing? How are we using cloud within the department? That's uh, a great question. We are 1 of 1 of the things that I mentioned, which was using external resources to the extent possible. Um, is 1 of our goals because um, it just allows us a lot more flexibility. Uh, we have ventured into the cloud space, all of our um, collaboration tools, the, all of the Microsoft products are cloud-based. We're uh, using Office 365 extensively now. Uh, we have entered into the world of uh, cloud-based servers and storage uh, and are looking at um, really kind of getting out of the, completely getting out of the data center business. Uh, because of the fact that there are so many other people that can do it on, on a, a much, much larger scale. So between the collaboration that we've uh, done with the state of Missouri, uh, we uh, consolidated our data center with them several years ago, but even they are, are transitioning to the cloud. It's an exciting new space and it provides us with a lot of flexibility. Awesome. Thank you. Thank One you. other question on the fiber. So. Are, are, Majority of these lines um, owned by other companies, or is that something that we've invested in uh, to have the infrastructure in place to to be able to uh, have connection throughout the state? The majority of them are owned by other. The, the actual fiber itself is owned by other companies, but we have a legal right to use it. If you're familiar with the CenturyLink agreement, mm -hmm. uh, that okay. provides us with. We've got dark fiber that we can uh, um, utilize. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, if I, I might just comment um, briefly, both on uh, the communications and on the information systems um, uh, work that's been done, you know, that I, I like the fact that these were um, combined in one commission meeting because communications and information systems connect MoDOT 
to each other and to the customers that we serve. And they both do that. But if you really look at the history of these departments, um, they actually, through their innovation and their work over the past couple decades, uh, certainly in recent times, but over the past couple decades, communications um, uh, piloted uh, telework. Uh, we have uh, flexibility with our communications and our customer services ranks uh, from dating back into the mid 90s when we set up those uh, customer service centers and that 24-7 um, support. Uh, we've had teleworking policies in place uh, since that time. They, they pioneered that. And uh, information um, systems, with particularly with the fiber investments that uh, Commissioner Boatwright uh, just mentioned in some of the um, uh, procurement that was done uh, a couple decades ago, we've benefited from that tremendously over the past uh, couple decades. But um, those two organizations and certainly Linda and Beth and their leadership teams and everybody working in those, um, had we not had these people in place, these investments in place, we would not have functioned in the manner that we did this past year during the pandemic. Uh, we simply would have um, failed in our mission, uh, in my opinion, had we not had the um, the capabilities and the responsiveness of these two divisions. It's, it really cannot be, um, cannot be overstated how important uh, this is. And you know what it does is it reminds us how important these two divisions are to the department on a daily basis and a strategic level every day anyway. Um, but it's been highlighted in the pandemic in ways that, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly uh, learning from uh, everything that we've experienced this year. And we're going to carry forward um, really important improvements to our operations uh, and flexibilities for our uh, employees going forward. Uh, but it's, it, it starts with these two divisions and certainly um, Beth and Linda and their leadership has been incredible this past year. So I just want to extend my thanks to a grateful department for both IS and communications. Very good. Other comments or questions? Uh, Patrick, I was going to make the same comment about having both communications and the information system in the same meeting. I don't know whose decision that was, but uh, that, that was good the way they work hand in hand. And, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call it yours, Mr. Chairman. Great job. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how that worked, but <laughs> anyway, thank you, Beth. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time it takes to put that presentation together as well. We're going to move now to our uh, high priority unfound, unfound, funded, not unfounded for sure, but unfunded needs. And uh, Eric Schroeder's here, and uh, I believe Eric's got uh, a couple folks with him. I'll let him introduce. But uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have with me today Eric Curdy and Frank Miller. Frank is our uh, Planning manager in the Southwest District. He's going to give you a little bit of a, a flair of understanding this from the district point of view. And Eric Curdy is our transportation planning director for the state. He's going to give you a little bit more of the statewide view. Uh, to kick us off this morning, one, you know, because what, really what we're going to talk about is the work of a lot of dedicated staff, but really hundreds of Missourians have participated in this process that we're going to talk about today. But I want us to step back, and if we can go to the presentation, please, Jen. I want us to step back to the Citizen's Guide. The Citizen's Guide for Transportation has been a transformational document that we've been using, and this is one of the outgrowths of it. Uh, one of the things that we've learned and utilized, and, and this is really great to be able to talk about as we've uh, utilized that document to help educate and promote transportation funding. Uh, next slide, please. This slide here is actually one of the pages out of the, out of the Citizen's Guide where we talk about the unfunded needs of the highway system. And it's a huge number, you know, $825 million a year, or $8 billion. It's hard for us to, to understand that, you know, for my family budget, that's, un, that's unfathomable money. Uh, so what we've done is actually taking these categories and going through this process to come up with the, finding the needs of taking it from a category to a specific project. And people can understand and support a project better than they can support a category of funding. It's difficult though to, to uh, get this list together. It takes a lot of work, but it also validates the number because there's some people that challenge the number as being unfounded. 
as just being a pie in the sky type of number. In reality, it's very concrete and founded in direct projects. And what we've done here and what we're going to share today is the latest up to date to that. We did our first one in 2019. And today we're going to talk about what we did this year to update this list and the participation and the process that we've gone through uh, to do that. We're also going to ask for the commission to uh, endorse this process as an annual update to make it part of the policy that we will regularly update and bring this list forward to you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Curdy to talk to you about the process and give you a little bit of insight in it, and then he'll work with Frank to give you a little bit of understanding from a district perspective. So with that, Eric, please. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Director McKenna. You know, MoDOT has a long history of working with our planning partners who blanket our state. Um, through our established planning framework policy, MoDOT is able to collaboratively and strategically work with local officials throughout the state to address unlimited needs with limited resources in a bottom-up decision-making process. Uh, through this framework, MoDOT and its partners have developed a listing of high-priority unfunded needs in Missouri. Um, this work was done late winter, early this spring, and involved all of our planning partners and all of our district teams. Next slide, please. Oh, and one more. So this is the planning process or the planning framework, if you will, at a high level. Um, it shows MoDOT and its planning partners. It shows how we move needs to projects. Um, it shows each step taken and where decisions are made. Um, this process is ongoing and dynamic and works to identify the highest priorities in Missouri, given our limited resources. Next slide, please. So what we're really talking about today is, is a, a step here, it's step three, you know, where we prioritize lead, needs and looking closer. Um, this is where the districts work with our planning partners to create this listing um, through the planning framework process. What that supplies uh, data to our districts and to our planning partners to make decisions, uh, to help inform them about what, what is critical in these in these needs that they're prioritizing. And the data can include things like safety data, bridge and asset, uh, condition data, pavement data, and traffic volume data. Next slide. But who do we work with? So, as I mentioned, you know, our planning partners blanket the state. And this is a map of Missouri with all the planning partners shown, and you can see the blue boundary of our district boundaries. In Missouri, there's nine MPOs, and 18 RPCs. One RPC also functions as an MPO, and that is the Mid-America Regional Council in, in Kansas City. Um, with that alignment and our planning partners bound, boundaries being aligned, it really helps to streamline this process. You know, if you think about it, then only uh, planning partners only have to work with one district to engage in this planning framework process. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn it over to Frank, and he's going to share with you how the how they do this in the Southwest District, and um, how they develop the unfunded needs for that area of the state. Frank, thank you, Eric, and commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about how the unfunded needs lists are put together in the Southwest District. In Southwest, we prepare separate unfunded needs lists for the urban and rural parts of the district, but the process is similar for both areas. For the Southwest Rural District, the list is developed by a task force of planning partner staff and MoDOT staff. For the Urban District, the task force is made up of members of the Ozarks Transportation Organization's Technical Committee and MoDOT staff. Each group meets two to three times to develop the unfunded needs lists. This year, of course, all the meetings were virtual. The infinite needs list comes from the system improvement priority list and some long-term asset management needs not addressed in our asset management plan. To build the system improvement lists, planning partners collect ideas through city and county meetings, general public involvement, regional and metropolitan area plans, along with needs identified by MoDOT from customer comments, traffic studies, and corridor studies. Like STIP development, the infinite needs list is a culmination of other planning activities, including RPC prioritization processes, various MPO plans, our district-wide prioritization process, our safety plan, and the asset management plan. And so we think hundreds of people have contributed at some point in the process of needs identification and prioritization. 
ranging from a citizen providing a comment online about an MPO plan to a city council person participating on their RPC's Transportation Advisory Committee. To put the input and needs list together, both the urban and rural groups work off of a spreadsheet that incorporates a list of all the priorities and the funding level allocated for each tier. Both, both groups work by consensus to apportion the funds to the various needs until the overall funding goal is met. In Southwest, we follow a similar process to decide what system improvement projects will go into the STIP. And this year, we developed both the STIP and the unfunded needs list simultaneously because of the timing of both projects. Developing consensus involves a collaborative dialogue between MoDOT and the planning partners. We have a high level of MoDOT staff involvement in the process, not just planning staff and district management, but our area engineers, traffic engineers, project managers, and design staff. This helps MoDOT provide good service to our planning partners by sharing what we know about safety and congestion issues, asset conditions, and project delivery concerns for potential future projects. At the same time, that helps planning partners better understand the challenges we face in addressing needs, including the potential scope of some of the projects that would address specific needs, project coordination strategy, and project delivery timelines. One key bonus of the high level of involvement of the BODOT district staff is that when something moves from the unfunded needs list to the STIP, there will be two to three project team members who will have been involved with the project from the very beginning when it was prioritized as a need, and they will know firsthand why the project was selected for the STIP and thus ensure the project addresses that original need. Finally, as a MoDOT district planner, having an up-to-date unfunded needs list is very helpful for preparing the STIP and for developing potential funding scenarios. It helps us transition between the many needs on the overall list and the reality of what we might actually be able to fund. It also provides stability for our program delivery process by giving us an idea of what projects are essentially on deck to be programmed in the future. Thank you again. I will now turn this back over to Mr. Curdy to conclude our presentation. Thanks, Frank. Next slide, please. So what's the results? So here is a depiction of tier one. And if you remember when Eric mentioned those buckets, that's basically what you see before you. So now you've got it by category and by area of the state. And this shows the results of tier one. If you, um, if you see there in the bottom right, it's about $540 million were identified in tier one. And those are the projects, you know, tier one, people say, well, what's tier one mean? Tier one basically means those are the projects we believe to be accomplished in the time horizon of the STIP, years one through five of the 10 year horizon. Next slide, please. Here's those same projects shown on a map, and we, we've categorized them by those buckets again in the colors, where, whether it be improved bridge condition and all the way to major interstate reconstruction. Just simple color coding, trying to keep it simple. Next slide, please. And then it, here it is on a pie graph. The pie graph, you know, is the full 8.25 billion or 825 million a year, 8.25 over 10 years. And it shows how much has been accomplished since the last time, which was 740 million. And then it adds in the 540 million that we've identified so far. Next slide, please. So what were the results of tier two? Here they are. It's about $2.2 billion of fund or of needs that have been identified. Um, so that's bringing this total to about 2.7. And what is tier two? That's again, that's year six through 10. What we think we could accomplish in the full 10 year horizon, but notably in year six through 10. Next slide, please. And here's what tier two looks like on a map. Getting a little more busy. Still, it's, to me, you know, it's it's always amazing that, like Eric mentioned, 2.2 billion kind of goes over your head, but even here, it doesn't look like a whole lot in the state, but it's starting to fill up. And again, the color coding again for what has been identified. Next slide, please. And then here's the full pie graph with all of those things put together. Again, 742 million that we have previously moved from the unfunded needs list into projects, the 540 million from the first tier of this exercise, and the 2.2 billion for this slide. Next slide, please. So one of the things that um, 
we don't want to lose sight of is there's a lot of bridges in Missouri and there's some really big bridges. So this list shows the major bridge needs over the next 10 years. And as you recall, um, major bridge funds are handled centrally in the state. And so we've categorized those into what projects would be done in the next 10 years. And this list totals about $410 million. Next slide, please. So what are our next steps? Uh, I think Patrick mentioned it earlier. Our next step, you know, is to really do another tier this summer with our planning partners of about another $2 billion in projects that we could identify. Also, for the first time, we'll create a multimodal tier of about a billion dollars using the same formulas as before, all being done by the in the summer of 2021. You know, having this process helps us move forward with planning partners quickly and strategically in our stint, and if new, new if there was a increased investment in transportation. So we respectfully ask for the commission's consideration of approving an annual process of identifying high priority unfunded, unfunded needs. Um, and we can take any questions or comments you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Frank. Are there any questions or comments? I don't really yeah. have a question, Mr. Chairman, but Eric and Eric, when we talk about 825 million unfunded needs, it's a, it's a huge number. It's hard for me to wrap my hands around, but uh, when you have a list of specific projects like it that shows, uh, I mean, it's real how many transportation needs we really have. So uh, great job. It's a great presentation. We've just got to keep working on funding to so we can someday get these projects done. Uh, probably not in my lifetime, but I hope my grandkids. But uh, it was a great job and it was a very good presentation. Thank you both Eric and Eric and Frank. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And yeah, you're, you're very right. That specific list of projects is much easier to talk about than $825 million in need. Uh, when we start going through the list, and I believe your attached is the, uh, with your, your backup information is the full listing of all the projects. That uh, is what allows us to work with people that have come up with when there's funding available at the federal level or local level. Uh, they're much more willing to try to find one of those projects to put that money on. Yeah, and you know, kudos to our, our local uh, levels too that know the projects, you know, that need to be done. So we appreciate their uh, their teamwork and you know, this list is just going to continue to grow. So thank you. Eric. I think you had a comment. Yeah, I thought this was great. If you can you go back to a, like tier one or tier two slide that shows um, the color coding because I think it's easier to see that. The, the majority, well, first tier one, Kansas City was 100 million. They put all their money in uh, economic growth and safety. And the same in tier two. Uh, when you look at those maps, they're mostly red below uh, Interstate 70, and they're all blue above because they're working on their roads up there, which we know they need. But what what is the economic development? Is that... Uh, Commerce is there a benefit cost ratio that we look at when we decide those those projects and does each of the planning partners have the same criteria for economic growth and do we inure any benefit from that economic growth as the as MoDOT? I know the state will, but uh, could we have an example of what economic growth is? Sure. So, so that's that's a great question. And yeah, the definition does vary a little bit across the state, but mainly this is uh, places where we're looking to add something to the system that either adds new access or new capacity. Uh, sometimes this is a new interchange uh, to open up an area for development, uh, new access to uh, from ports to rail. Uh, we we work with some of those that would like to have more direct access from interstate connections to. Uh, commercial development areas. Those are typical things that kind of go in that uh, economic growth. It, it's an expansion of the system as opposed to taking care of something that's there now. And uh, Commissioner Brinkman, uh, to follow up on that, we do um, take the STIP in its in its aggregated form and uh, we uh, have uh, outside uh, economic experts that look at that and determine what the what the economic benefit to those investments would be over a 20 year period. We've been doing that for um, quite some period of time. So we update it every year. 
And what you find is when we are funded at a very base level, uh, as we have been over the last 10 years or so, the economic benefit for the investment uh, when we're doing uh, preservation work, which is vitally important, you do have jobs benefits and, and uh, work created and, and uh, multiplier effects. Uh, that tends to run in the two to two and a half times per dollar invested in terms of overall economic benefit to the state. When we get into those projects that, um, that expand capacity, that encourage uh, economic um, uh, growth, uh, whether it's industrial capacity or otherwise, um, that tends to run upwards of four to four and a half times uh, per dollar invested. So they're both good investments, one's better than the other, um, but you know, certainly there's an economic decline that comes with not preserving the system itself. Your question as to whether or not the department, whether the system itself uh, shares in that benefit, uh, very rarely do we. Um, that's uh, those economic um, impacts are felt through um, general revenue collections through income and sales taxes that occur in the state. Um, certainly, some of the sales taxes that are dedicated in things like uh, transportation development districts um, that get um, used as some of the share to to expand the system or to develop off system uh, some of those uh, it's an indirect effect but from a revenue perspective the investment that comes into transportation um, benefits the general uh, fund of state government not so much um, uh, is it reflected in investments back at at MoDOT with I think a notable exception um, in the past couple of years with the governor's focus on bridge program where we did secure uh, $351 million of general revenue investment uh, for road and bridge projects. First time uh, that I'm aware of the state's um, actually taken some of that economic benefit and folded it back into the department. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really important question you asked um, from a policy perspective. And certainly as, um, as discussions uh, go forward, both at the state and the federal level, with how to fund transportation, that's that's important. I, I will note that, and in, in, um, Eric and Eric did a great job, and Frank, um, but there's a really important slide, that, that pie chart that we had. What you'll notice from the 2019 plan, which I think helped us define, and it really came to life with the governor's focus on bridge program, because we had done this unfunded needs list, I think it became more palatable for policymakers to to um, take the risk of investing general revenue into the system or to expand the, the investment that we received. We've pulled down uh, to about $251 million so far out of the 350 um, to focus on those bridges. And, and uh, you know, as has been reported by uh, Travis, um, we're nearly 200 bridges into that in terms of the contracts. But um, you'll see that with that $350 million, or what we've only used is 250 so far, we've actually pulled $742 million from the unfunded needs list in 20, um, 2019 into what, are, what is our draft stip that we'll be pr uh, presenting to you. Three to one benefit, that's because we matched with federal funds. We pulled down the infra grant and the build grant um, related to Rocheport and Buck O'Neill uh, and several other uh, components like that. So, you know, not only are you getting a three for one return so far on the general revenue invested in, in MoDOT, um, that's before we calculate the two and a half to four times economic benefit overall. So you're literally a dollar of general revenue. In this case, we can actually track and prove that that's gonna have a 10 to 12 times multiplier uh, for the general economy. What an investment, right? This is, a, this is an amazing story. And um, the, the process that uh, we're going through, and we're asking for your consideration to, to approve these projects that we've got in this unfunded needs on deck list, and, and also the process going forward, I think is vital to our, our future success. So the team's done a really nice job. The one thing I will say is when we go back next year to do this, that $825 has been held static for the last five years. Um, we started identifying that in the in the um, in the citizens guide. We've not inflated that. So part of our annual process is going to be more sophisticated. We're going to 
We're going to calculate the unfunded needs. We're going to look at the inflation impact that's occurred um, since we last updated the list, and that'll be annual. And then we'll take off the progress we've made each year uh, to get a net what the unfunded needs is. Uh, I think it's important to say, you know, we're trying to define, uh, by the time we're done this summer, we'll have defined about half of the unfunded needs directly by projects, not the full set. Um, but that puts us in the policy purview to, to make progress. So essentially, uh, talking to Commissioner Boatwright um, yesterday, you know, I, I think the phrase he used was a buy-down list, uh, and that's, that's an appropriate thing. We've got a buy-down on deck list here. Um, it's, it's an exciting prospect. It led to success with the focus on bridge program, and we've got proven um, benefits as a result of that. So I, I am thrilled by the work that the department's done, and I am I am so appreciative of our planning partners and how how well they were willing to engage in this process, how excited they were about it, and how hard they worked on it, and how seriously they took it. Uh, this is a win for Missouri on all fronts. So Patrick, earlier you said that uh, we, if everything, all the stars line up, you could get three billion of our ten billion unfunded. That would chew up that, and it would do a billion and a half into that red slide we just saw. Be the... Yeah, I mean, if if everything lines up, I I think there's a possibility there's a possibility that some resources could be made available by policymakers out of the uh, uh, COVID relief funds, the American uh, Relief Act. Um, that we don't know the scale of, but that could be significant. Um, the uh, the Jobs Act that has 115 billion um, designated in proposed form uh, for transportation for for this aspect of transportation. Uh, that's uh, we're still hearing whether that's a five year or an eight year plan. Um, but in that context, that could bring as much as you know two. 200 to 230 or 40 million dollars a year over that period of time uh so that's another you know potentially billion billion um two to billion three um on top of it and then we have surface transportation reauthorization that you know one of the things i am hearing is um the administration the biden administration is looking at this as the jobs act is the plus up the additional investment in transportation and they um, they see a level funded surface transportation reauthorization. So kind of what funds our base level stip right now. Uh, I, I do think that Congress looks at this a little more um, potentially expansively where reauthorization might bring additional resources also. That remains to be seen over the next several months. Uh, but again, I, I think we have scaled the work here to be able already, no matter what the scenarios in terms of stars lining up that we can see, uh, I, I think we already have a uh, kind of a, a locally supported, locally forwarded and vetted um, and regionalized uh, priority list that that could be um, could take advantage of any of the scenarios that we're that we're hearing or talking about in whatever size they come. Uh, and that's that's the exciting thing. One of the things we will have to do, and this is a little bit of a nuance here, to be successful with all of these, like we were with the focus on bridge program, you, you may recall that what we did was we, uh, the governor really supported the local planning process, which was an extraordinary uh, policy move that he made uh, and, and just gets to how how well he understands because of all his experience, how all of this works. But we selected bridge projects that were already in our STIP, which was planned resources availability. That gave us the ability to then um, accelerate and move forward on average about a year earlier than we would have in our existing STIP. So we're banking success there, but then it, it created uh, resource availability for this next STIP that we're developing right now. That's why we've been able to fund Buck O'Neill and Roachport uh, and several other projects that'll be that really come to life in this stip that we're that we're updating right now, and and if we use that same methodology where we fund what we already have in our project development cycle, we'll get to construction very quickly on new money, and then the money that was allocated there we can extend out um, and pull projects off the unfunded list. So it's almost like you get a two for one benefit. Uh, and then the multiplying effect of that. It's really exciting. I think we've 
developed, um, frankly, I think we've developed a, a bit of a better mousetrap here in terms of project development, on deck lists, and how to use substitute funding um, to still go through the planning process and, and get the, the unfunded priorities <laughs> funded, um, but also give our teams uh, the project development time necessary to go through the environmental work, uh, right away utilities, uh, all of the things that are required to, to bring to successful completion from concept to final construction. Uh, that's, that's how we generate success here, is to get to construction. But we have to have an orderly process to do that uh, so that we're not um, getting out of our kind of production level work that we do that we're successful with. It's, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, that does get a little wonky. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I hope you can, can see that uh, we're very excited by this and, and we really appreciate um, the commission actually pushing us toward this, guiding us toward this type of definition of projects that are unfunded, uh, because I think this is a huge service to the, to the state and, and to policymakers in the state that um, need definition for the political risk to attach new, new uh, resources to the work that we do. Uh, I, I think it fits very nicely, and um, and it's going it's going to drive success at whatever level of additional resource we can secure. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah. I move we approve the unfunded uh, needs uh, program that's just been presented. Thank you, John. Is there a second? There's a second right here, and, and I would add that. Um, since I'm the new guy on the block, um, I, I just want to commend the rest of the commissioners and the staff um, and our planning partners that had enough foresight to put this together. Um, it really, I, I can't tell you how, how much this puts us uh, ahead of the game, not only, um, I mean, across the entire country. I mean, we, this, this puts us in a very good position to execute any funding that's going to come about and you know we can either do the work on the front side or the back side typically if you do work on the back side it costs more uh, so i'll just commend everyone involved on this effort because it's really going to pay the state big dividends down the road so thank you and and i second that motion thank, thank you dustin mr chairman yes before we vote i had a couple of comments i i'm in support of the motion um uh, but to to go along with what um bob was asking about our uh, benefit or return to us on the increased economic growth um, I, i'm not in favor i mean i'm in favor of this process but i'm not in favor of adding things to the system until we get our current system up in good shape and so to me it looks to me like there would be a negative return on us if we have to add things if we're adding things to the system for economic growth for the general revenue or the general good of the state we're increasing our costs because those are more roads that we have to take care of when we have roads that we're not even taking care of now so like that 300 million dollars in my mind in that category um, the best use of those dollars would be to go to getting our roads up into shape that are deteriorating rapidly. Yeah, I, I think that's the balancing act. That's that's the balancing act. So, uh, so we have a motion and a second to approve the recommendation. And just just to be clear, the recommendation is to. Uh, make this a yearly update and to proceed with the process that was outlined by Eric and his team. Is that pretty well covered, Eric? Is there something else I should put into that motion? Um, Mr. That Chairman, there's actually a policy revision that you're also approving that includes that. Okay, thank and you, Pam. So th this would include that policy revision that's in our backup material. And a yes. approval of the actual list itself too, right? Okay get that and, and include the list. So all, that, uh, all that's make, in my motion. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we, we covered everything there. So <laughs> all in all in favor of the re the recommendation and things we just outlined, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? 
Okay, thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Eric and Eric and and Frank. Appreciate your time this morning. Bring that to us. It's good work. It it reminds me of how important the uh, planning partners are to everything that MoDOT does. So, it, it's, uh, important work. Ms. Mr. Chairman, if I could, uh, you know, Commissioner Ecker's um, comment is is well taken, uh, and and actually um, very much a hallmark of the asset management uh, um, process that we've put in place in the last several years. Um, many of the um, economic development interests in the state are very frustrated with our um, uh, our inability to support uh, those types of projects. Uh, and we've been, in, I, I think we've been one of the most disciplined DOTs in the in the country. Um, uh, certainly over the last decade, as we've implemented asset management, the vast majority of what we hear, even when we when we do our long range planning, the number one um, response we get from our uh, from the citizens of the state when when asked what their top priority for the department is, is to take care of the existing system. And and that is baked into um, virtually everything we do, and uh, it 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 certainly um, creates a, a, a very much a frustration um, of existing condition and economic development. Um, and you know, frankly, the resource availability to do everything doesn't exist, even with what we're talking about. However, um, the vast majority, if you look at the, you know, when we bring the updated STIP to you, you will see um, in May that um, well over 90% of the dollars uh, in that updated STIP uh, are dedicated to taking care of the existing system. And, uh, you know, while that is a uh, very much a frustration on some uh, advocates parts uh, throughout the state, uh, I, I do think that that is the the fundamental basis of what we're doing, and um, and we're very focused on that. Uh, it's still not enough to get everywhere and and get those conditions where we'd like them. That's the primary focus, and I and I do think that's a good point um, made by Commissioner Ecker because, you know, you really can't if if you can't maintain what you're building, um, you know, expansion is is very difficult to justify. So I appreciate those comments. I agree. We have to look at that pretty hard. Okay, we'll move now to our comment period. Pam, I don't know of any public comments. Do, do you have anything for us there? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, no commenters have registered. All right, then we'll move to our uh, time for commission comments. And uh, I think I'll start with the senior commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Greg Smith. Greg? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. No, I, uh, I don't really have much to say, can you believe that? But uh, no, I just, uh, it was a good meeting. I'm glad that uh, we were able to get it uh, accomplished. Uh, again, Patrick, congratulations on your chairmanship uh, of the safety. Uh, we appreciate everybody. I appreciate everyone's hard work. All the presentations were very good today. I uh, enjoyed them all. Uh, that's about all I have. See you next month. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, Greg. Commissioner Ecker, you're on deck. Floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I want to thank the chairman for having Nicole do that safety update um, and talk about uh, being safe out there. Uh, I think that was very important. She did a great job. Uh, also, as always, uh, Jay and his team over at the legislature have been doing a fantastic job and seeing a lot of positive results that are coming our way. Uh, and like Greg said, congratulations to Patrick on on his uh, continued success with AASHTO and leadership there. And I also thought that the communications and information presentation were uh, great to learn more about those. And then uh, I know I'm a broken record, but uh, it, it's just so frustrating out here in the northwest part of the state. I know I'm not the only place, but these roads are terrible. And um, it's always on the front of my mind because every time I get on the road, I have to get beat up in my truck getting over to 71 Highway. So, um, but I know we're making making progress. 
So with that, that's all I have. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Terry. Commissioner. Patrick, Patrick. Maybe you ought to try four. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Mr. Chairman. I, I thought it was a great meeting and it's cool to see all those presentations, but I'm impressed. Uh, you know, we're, we're all uh, uh, know how passionate that uh, Patrick is about uh, our MoDOT and our all of our other employees, but to see the excitement in his presentation today and the excitement from the other employees, I think is great. This uh, transportation bill, I hope it goes through. We all thought that President Trump was going to hit that easy button two or three years ago, and he didn't. But uh, to be talking about $515 billion of transportation work in this country, I think is is phenomenal. Uh, and to be able to do 30% of our unfunded projects would just be uh, wonderful. I, I don't know how we'll pay for that in the future, but I'm sure that uh, the House and the Senate will figure out how to get that money from us again. But uh, anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great that uh, that we have some excitement around here. That it, uh, it's not always that way at the commission. So hopefully that will get uh, passed. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Commissioner Briscoe, you're up. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to uh, also um, congratulate or again uh, say how proud I think we should be of Corey Beasley and and those those employees, all of our employees who uh, do the work. They not only do their work, but they they have the uh, uh, the good of of the commission and the and the entire state at heart when uh, all the time when they're out there even if they're uh, on their own and just as Corey Beasley was when he no, noticed this jackass uh, trying to steal our tractor and uh, I, you know I, that's very impressive to me and I know uh, many of our employees act and feel the same way. I also want to mention. Uh, with regard to Patrick's uh, assuming the chairmanship of the safety committee of Ashto, I think that is it, it. It speaks so well for Patrick, but it also speaks well for the state of Missouri, for other states to realize we're doing something right. I know our state, uh, uh, in many ways, we're we're not ranked among the highest, but with regard to this. I think it speaks well for us and it helps the entire state. And I, I thank you for doing that, Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well said, John. Uh, Commissioner Boatwright. It's all yours. Yeah, I'll just, you know, I, I'm not going to go back and echo all the comments that have been made, but um, I would like to thank uh, Commissioner Smith for the involvement that he has uh, with that local staff there in Clinton. But that's that's so important to recognize um, the folks that are really boots on the ground and getting things done on a day to day basis. So thank you so much for that, Commissioner Smith. Um, I, I just keep and I, and I sound like a broken record on this, but I, I'm so impressed with the MoDOT staff from top to bottom. Um, from left to right, I mean, however you want to put it, uh, I just continue to be impressed with the process, with the um, system that we have in place. And uh, I really think we're on a path to success here. Um, some funding hit at the right time, uh, you know, funding hits at the right time. Uh, there's no question that this team is willing and ready to get the work done. So um, super proud of this team and, and uh, just appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks, Dustin. Well, I'm That's probably, a nice comment. Yeah, I, I'm probably going to uh, repeat some of the things that were said. But uh, number one, I want to pat Nicole Hood on the back one more time for her rushing together to put together a presentation. Really, uh, I, I could listen to her every commission meeting. She she presents the safety issues so well, and some of those videos we've seen in the past have just been amazing. So. Nicole, uh, hopefully you're still on, and I just want to say thanks again for that. Greg, thank you very for, much. You bet. Greg, for uh, pointing out the, the work that uh, Greg did, and that story was amazing. Thank you for that. Um, 
I'll echo again, you know, the the fact that Asto is, has come to Patrick to ask him to continue in this leadership role with the safety. Uh, I, I agree with everybody that's, that's already said it, but it does show that Missouri is doing something right. Even, even though we may not rank as high as, as others on their list of topics, we're, we're ranking pretty high in the things that we're doing on the ground and, and the, our safety program. So Patrick, thank you for, uh, being willing to do that and uh, the time you're going to spend on that. I know it's going to be a great asset for everyone across the country. Uh, Linda Horn's presentation on communication, uh, I thought was great. You know, where would we be this past year without those communication folks? I mean, just look at Dustin sitting up there and how good he looks. We, we have to uh, <laughs> commend all those folks that, that are doing this and, linking us together and and one thing i'll mention she she briefly mentioned the the flickr page and if you go on there you'll see some exceptional photos that uh, the modot folks have taken over the years and it's uh it's worth your time just to kind of browse through some of those photos and then beth ring and and the uh, the it team you know again how would we hold these meetings without those folks in the background keeping us connected so kudos to all um uh, finally uh terry i you know i i want to emphasize what terry said you know i'm i, I of course i live on a, a a rural road as well and and i know we get tired of talking about rural roads but you know when we talk about the economy the state of missouri is driven by agriculture and those rural roads are important to agriculture so uh the the impact i think is lost when we talk about rural roads and uh, the impact that it has on the agricultural economy and the economy of our state. So we have to continue to uh, prioritize that. And and I agree, we're, we're working on that hard. We've, we've made some great steps here recently and uh, I applaud Patrick for the work he's doing there and uh, his willingness to to take that up and, and the progress that we've made on that. So with that, is there any other business to come before the commission? Seeing Move that, to adjourn. There's a motion Second. to adjourn. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. Before we adjourn, I'll remind everyone our next meeting is May 5th. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. We had a great meeting today. Appreciate everybody's time.